Do you think that we can prevent cancer? Contextually, it- within reason, right? Some people have genetic predispositions for cancer, like we talked about Lynch syndrome to begin with. Those people may have to do more to reduce their risks for cancer. So I'm very remiss to use the word prevent. And actually, uh, there are some people when I first started my channel, I was using that word a lot and it was actually triggering a lot of cancer patients. It makes people upset because it implies that they could have done something. They could have done something. And oftentimes there's not much you can do. You can do the best you can do, but that's it. You can't do any more than what the best is. Regarding prevention or risk reduction, all we can do is eat a balanced diet. If we have the ability to acquire enough fiber, various different types of fiber, eat lots of protein, exercise, try and keep our weight down, our blood pressure down. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode of the show. Now, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P. Why is BetterHelp so important? Because a healthy brain, a healthy emotional state is a healthy life. It's very important that if you are feeling any kind of certain way, actually, whether it's good or bad, it's very important to process. And you don't necessarily have to wait for something to go wrong before you begin to express yourself. So what BetterHelp is, is an online therapy. It offers video, phone, even live chat only therapy sessions. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. You don't have to wait in line in an office. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy. You will be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Investing in time to process thoughts and emotions are critical for success. And everybody listening to this podcast wants to get better in some capacity. We talk all about health, but we cannot neglect our mind. Head on over to BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Dr. Lion. My listeners get 10% off their first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Dr. Lion. Dr. Joe Zundel. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, Was not expected you to be tatted up, but um, love it. Yeah, thanks. Absolutely love it. Yeah, we can talk about it some other time. And Well, maybe we'll talk about it today. Sure. Um, I wanted to have you on because there's a lot of interest and information in the space of cancer. And you are actually a cancer researcher and well-published. I was uh, pretty impressed. Thanks. I appreciate it. (laughs) A lot of effort into those uh, publications. Um, I would say that there's nothing more scary for my patients or really for any individual than cancer. I'm curious as to how you actually got involved in cancer research. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a great question. And it's something that I try and, and maintain transparency on my own platforms with. Um, so a lot of reason why I got in, involved in cancer research was largely personal. So as I've spoken with you kind of offline, uh, personally, my mom had cancer. Um, she was diagnosed with esophageal cancer when... Uh, you know, towards the end of my high school career. And, um, you know, when you see somebody, uh, a loved one of yours go through that disease, it kind of changes things inside of you. Um, you know, at that point in my life, I was very, very involved with marine biology. Um, and I was hell bent on this track of, of pursuing marine biology. And so seeing my mom get sick, uh, changed things and, and also changed the way that I, I thought about particular diseases. So eventually when I got into undergrad after my mom passed and everything like that, Um, I was on this marine bio track, but it just didn't feel right. And so I decided to change gears a little bit and I I started figuring out that I was, you know, really in tune with biochemistry and and specifically cancer biology. I had some really good professors in undergrad in Florida where I went to school at St. Leo University. Um, And I did some internships at the Moffitt Cancer Research Center for a bit. And I just kind of fell in love with it. And there was something oddly therapeutic about studying cancer biology to me that just made me feel better at the end of the day, like that what I was doing was was the right thing. And also um, trying to understand this information so that way I can translate it for other people to understand just how complex this disease is. So I'm, I'm a cancer biologist due to personal reasons, but now it's become something uh, much more. Yeah, that's uh, very impactful in that. Yeah. Because it's personal, it yeah. probably makes your Try mission. Not to get upset. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> um, at, at the time, d- did you feel just helpless? Yeah. So yeah, this is kind of leading into the tattoo. Uh, my tattoo is my scientific journey. Um, so at the top of my tattoo is a is actually like a memorandum for my mom uh, to kind of exemplify the helplessness that I felt at the time. 
So I pursued a cancer biology degree, eventually graduating with a PhD over in a, at a school in Philadelphia called the University of Sciences. Um, <clears throat> and um, sorry, I got a little bit distracted. Um, but basically that level of helplessness uh, that I felt kind of translated into how I went about pursuing my science. And so, like I said, it was therapeutic to study all of these various things in cancer. Um, and now I don't necessarily feel as helpless anymore yeah. because now I feel like I have acquired the, the tool set from an educational perspective to be able to offer that to people and, and show them how complex this disease is and try and make them feel more comfortable about some of the things that even cancer patients may feel when they enter the clinic. Their doctors are prescribing these medications. I can explain to them, you know, what exactly they're doing, um, off target effects, if any, and sort of what they can expect from the therapy. Mm. Yeah. And when people talk about cancer, they always talk about cancer in this global yeah. term, but really there's multiple different kinds of cancers, mm -hmm. the way in which they interact in the body, totally different. Can you uh, highlight some of that stuff for the listener? Like the, the what is cancer sort yeah, of thing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, basically, if I was to summarize um, on, a, on a layman's terms level, uh, what is cancer? Cancer is essentially this this ability of cancer cells to continually divide past what is considered uh, quote unquote normal. Um, and as they adapt these abilities to continuously divide, they adapt new metabolic programs, um, whether it's utilizing glucose, amino acids, and we'll talk about a little bit of those later, um, or even fat sources uh, to sustain their metabolism, or if they're driven by genetic factors like uh, mutations, um, which can increase specific likelihoods for disease. So um, cancer being this kind of blanket term for uh, a variety of different types of cancers is essentially established upon all of these various environmental and genetic factors combined, which um, vary on a patient by patient basis. Hmm. And it's different for everybody, right? Whether Absolutely. there's a genetic, and just because someone has a genetic predisposition doesn't mean there's a 100% penetrance or uh, for the most part, an absolute diagnosis that they're going to get. No. No, I mean there are there are some genetic cases. For example, um, there's this this syndrome called Lynch syndrome yeah. for people who have you know high very high likelihood for developing colon cancer. It's like something like greater than fifty percent of them will will get colon cancer. Actually, one of my friends has Lynch syndrome, um, which is a genetic heritable mutation of a, of a specific protein, the name mm -hmm. of which doesn't necessarily matter here, but it, it dramatically increases their their likelihood of developing colon cancer. As an example. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they will get colon cancer. It's just that the likelihood is significantly greater. And so people who have that particular syndrome, uh, there's certain things that they have to do through their lifestyle, uh, like, you know, eating a, a, excuse my language, but a shit ton of fiber mm -hmm. um, to kind of help offset the inflammatory effects that that come with that particular disease. And that, I mean, I'm sure that that's helpful. And uh, Lynch syndrome is pretty rare, right? Um. I don't know how rare it is, to be honest. All I know is um, people who have it uh, kind of sucks. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, so in terms of your personal research, can you uh, talk a little bit about what your research has been in, where it is now, where it's going, what your interests are? Sure. Um, so I started in a lab um, studying a type of cancer called con uh, <clears throat> excuse me, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. All these things are mouthfuls. <laughs> Um, they don't make it easy for us scientists, um, which is why we abbreviate things to CLL as an example, which is a type of blood cancer. And so it's specifically on an immune cell subset called B cells. And so these chronic lymphocytic leukemia patients or these CLL patients, they kind of have an outgrowth of these B cell populations and it essentially results in a very swollen spleen. Um, splenomegaly is the, the medical term for it. And so a lot of my research, early research, um, one of my first papers published was on targetable mechanisms in CLL as a component of kind of altered metabolism associated with how those, those cancer cells of that specific type continue to grow by specifically targeting this thing called the endoplasmic reticulum stress response or ER stress response. And so the ER stress response is essentially a way that even just normal B cells uh, maintain their their biology um, as B cells differentiate from kind of like naive B cells into plasma B cells, which secrete antibodies throughout our serum to kind of combat antigens in our environment. Um, they utilize the ER stress response to kind of 
um, differentiate into plasma B cells. And so cancer cells have found a way to use this in the, in the context of CLL. And so we can target those, those mechanisms with inhibitors against um, specific arms of the ER stress response. Um, and it's been relatively successful, although those drugs haven't made it into the clinic because um, unfortunately the ER stress response is very diverse. And oftentimes through clinical trials, the, the drugs which target it are, um, they can be pretty toxic because of those diverse right. kind of evolutionarily ingrained associations with that response. And is that one of the the challenges with the treatment of cancer, the toxicity of the chemotherapy? Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that that we, you know, try our best, not me specifically, but people who do clinical trials uh, try and weed out in um, in the clinical trials in, in early stages. Um, it's never easy to, you know, despite, you know, the mechanistic papers we, we publish on um, a variety of different drugs, it's never easy to make them as specific as we want them, just because um, inherently human biology is incredibly complicated. There's, there's overlap in just about everything. So we make a specific drug to target a specific mechanism, but by no means does it mean that uh, normal cells won't, won't utilize similar things right. uh, to mediate their own their function. And when it comes to cancer specifically, are there certain pathways that are known? Are there a handful of pathways that are really the highlight pathways for cancer? Um, yes, and this is kind of something that I've sent you uh, regarding the hallmarks of cancer. Which we will actually link. It's a great paper and apparently a milestone paper. Yeah, uh, there's three of them now and, and they kind of adapt over time. But if I were to summarize, um, we know specific uh, contributors to cancer that kind of broadly um, cover a variety of different cancers. Um, so people might see things like oncogenes, things like KRAS or MYC, all of these um, KRAS in this context is an enzyme which controls and is related to mTOR signaling mm -hmm. uh, protein biology. Um, MYC is a transcription factor, very hard to target clinically um, from a, a pharmacokinetic or pharmacology standpoint. Um, but there are a variety of overlapping targets like MYC, like a variety of different cancers, whether it's liver cancer, or even leukemias, um, will utilize MYC signatures or MYC transcription factor activity to promote uh, genes being increased, which can make those cancer characteristics right. worse. Right. Is it safe to say that there are really two groups of cancer? So there's the sporadic and inherited. Or is um, that just a complete oversimplification? No. Um, I think that they kind of work hand in hand. It is very oversimplified. Um, and oftentimes it's very contextual. So I think honestly might just leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, I would say that, and, and we could probably all agree about this in medicine, is there's very few diseases that are as complex as cancer with the multifaceted expressions of cancer um, than probably nearly anything in medicine. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, maybe this is biased because I'm a cancer biologist, but I certainly feel that way. Um, and I think as testament, as a part of our education, we have to learn uh, a lot of, of literally everything. Mm. So I've taken courses in microbiology, how various microbes interact with each other, whether it's, you know, talking about gut biology um, or viruses even because there's viral contributions yeah. to cancer, you know, like HIV. And also probably for treatment, right? They have now new emerging immunotherapy treatment. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to take all these different courses um, mm. through very diverse education to be able to understand what is cancer essentially. Okay. And in many ways, we still don't know. <laughs> Darn, because uh, again, it's really scary. For the listener, would you say that if we were to kind of distill it down as, as best as possible, that there's, um, you know, like that cancer, there's a component of it for cell regulation, uh, and then maybe uh, difficulty with controlling cell death, and then repair damage. Yeah. So um, <laughs> you're I mean, laughing. I know because I am um, simplifying it so no, much. No, no. But... This is this is literally. Yeah. I'm laughing because this is this is kind of like a necessary conversation yeah. we have to have in order to get people to understand right. just how complex this stuff is, and this is literally tying back to the hallmarks of cancer thing, and which is why I've gone through a lot of efforts on my Instagram to kind of break each of these hallmarks down so that people can say, okay, there are things related to DNA repair mechanisms which are are messed up. We have drugs to target those. There are things related to um, you know, hypoxic responses because as tumors grow, they have this kind of like 
um, very low oxygen core, and those can stimulate you know a lot of various things in cancers, which make it worse. Mm -hmm. We can target those. Um, whether it's continuous growth, like regarding sorry, kick the mic, uh, like regarding KRAS, we've produced now drugs to target KRAS metabolism. Um, so whether it's you know targeting continuous growth, senescence now, um, epigenetic modifiers uh, to um, very much change like methylation patterns in DNA, um, targeting DNA repair pathways, which are commonly messed up, like with BRCA gene mutations commonly seen in breast cancers, right. um, all these sorts of things. There's a lot of diverse strategies which ultimately culminate to these hallmarks of cancers. You know, I was um, I have a really good friend who is also a cancer researcher, and we've talked a lot about this, especially in the health and nutrition space, which we were talking about offline in terms of um, what are the things that people can actually do. And it's usually not one thing in particular, mm -hmm. right? There's not one food. There's not one chemical. I mean, who knows? Maybe that's true, but it there is a whole complex array of things that have to happen. Right. Um, when it comes to down to at its very core, could you define cancer as because you and I again we're speaking a disease of the like a genetic disease, whether it is inherent or sporadic, it really is a from what I understand a, a disease of the genome. Um. There, this debate has been going on for a very long time, whether it's a metabolic disease or a genetic disease. I'm in the camp of people that reasonably says that it's both. Um, because if we consider this from an evolutionary standpoint, in order for things to evolve as cancers do over time, from when a cancer cell originates from a particular tissue layer to when it develops as a tumor, um, if we consider this from an evolutionary perspective, it requires both genetic changes and environmental changes over time which even the genetic things from which, or environmental things from which the cancer started will change over time. They'll be very different from when that cancer started. So the also the mechanisms of action for what we target changes as time progresses uh, through, through a cancer patient's progression. In terms of obesity, we know that obesity is linked to mm -hmm. 13, according to uh, the CDC, a higher risk of 13 different cancers and that those 13 cancers, whether it's breast, colon, gallbladder, uh, make up roughly 40% of all cancers. Mm -hmm. um, what are some things that, well, number one, why is that? Is it because of it's a low grade inflammatory state? Is it because there's uh, some metabolic changes that are happening? Have you thought much about that? Yeah. Yeah. And it's something that in my last lab, we kind of considered a lot as, um, as we study, you know, the, the, the metabolic changes that happen in the context of the liver, at least when somebody becomes obese or they have that excess visceral adiposity, because uh, obesity is kind of like a fraction of the picture. But, um, you know, the, the, especially in the Western world, the hyper consumption of, or overconsumption of, of hyper palatable foods, um, can lead to conditions which kind of mess up, um, normal liver metabolism. And that can increase likelihoods for um, specific types of, of liver damage, which can eventually, you know, cancer is a progression. It's not like you just get cancer one day. It's all of these, these particular choices sometimes that we have as human beings, sometimes within our own control, sometimes not. Um, but they, over time, they can translate to uh, increased cancer rates. And a lot of it is metabolic, um, as we see, you know, in the context of liver cancer, again, like if you consume a lot of alcohol, if you eat a lot of um, fatty foods, they change the way that the liver metabolizes anything. They change the insulin glucagon ratio, all those sorts of things, which, you know, play this role in creating balance between how all of our organs kind of function together to maintain this, this state of homeostasis or balance in a, in a human being. Um, and we typically develop cancer um, when this, this balance is kind of offset. Um, and eventually over time, you know, when, when these people get cancer, that balance is, is messed up. And, you know, you mentioned alcohol and cancer and that that's a known risk. Yeah. And is there a certain amount of alcohol that would be advisable <laughs> versus not drinking at all? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is true with, with any carcinogen because, um, you know, alcohol is a carcinogen. Um, there are standards and I've done a post on this. I can't give you the exact numbers right now, but I've done a post on this explaining like, you know, dietary guidelines. Um, a drink a week isn't going to, going to, going to kill somebody or right. make them get cancer. Like I said, it's a progression. 
Um, but if you're, you know, drinking frequently, um, you know, if you're having a few beers a day, five times a week, four times a week, you're going to experience some issues over time. Mm -hmm. Um, cause your body, you know, we have these ingrained mechanisms to deal with these, you know, stresses. I've studied stress responses for a while. Um, we have ingrained mechanisms to deal with these, you know, our consumption of various foods, whether they're healthy for us or not. Um, but over time, if we continue to consume, uh, things like alcohol or, you know, a non-balanced diet, maybe low in protein, those sorts of things mm -hmm. over time, we'll develop not only cancer, um, but obesity, which can eventually lead to things like cancers. Yeah. I think that that's a really important perspective that it's, it's interesting how we normalize. Alcohol is very normalized. Yeah. And it's a normalized carcinogen, whereas, say, smoking is not. No one is like, yeah, you know, smoking is, no one's arguing, you know, you can have a cigarette a day and that's good for you. But you might hear people say, well, no, you should, uh, a glass of wine a day is okay. And, um, you know, perhaps that's good for you when actually, yeah, um, maybe it's not. A very special thank you to Timeline Nutrition for sponsoring this episode of the show. I am super pumped about Timeline Nutrition and what they make. They make a product called Mitopurin. It contains urolithin A, and urolithin A is a compound that is made by the gut microbiome. Some people will eat pomegranates, pomegranate juice, and be able to make this compound from their microbiome called urolithin A. Urolithin A has been shown in multiple studies from multiple labs over multiple years to improve energy through mitochondrial health to help with the generation and the essentially cleaning, it's called mitophagy, of old mitochondria. And this is extremely important to be able to, we have to replace damaged mitochondria with fresh new ones. I strongly suggest you head on over to timelinenutrition.com slash Dr. Lion. You'll get 10% off your order. MitoPure and urolithin A is going to be as important in our nutrition as fish oil. Head on over to timelinenutrition.com slash Dr. Lion. They have a lot of education out there. I also have an episode where I interviewed the CEO and head scientist of Timeline Nutrition. You can check that out. Now let's get on with the show. Yeah, no, and that's a really good point too, because I was actually in Mexico for my honeymoon somewhat recently. Really? And, when did uh, you get married? August uh, 28th. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. But outside of that, I was in Mexico and I saw in Mexico, they actually have the warnings on the, on the alcohol, you know, say this might cause like bold labeling in the airport mm -hmm. uh, saying this may cause cancer. And I literally told my wife, I was like, that's good. That's a good thing. They're telling people this because, you know, you go to the U.S. like here, we don't, we don't see that. And right. it's like you said, it's normalized. So I think that we should kind of normalize, um, you know, this kind of label associated with carcinogens in our environment. Yeah. You just reminded me of something sure. um, because you talked about the labeling. And I, I'm going to read this. So there's this Proposition 65 mm. in L.A. Or in L.A. Listen to me. In California. Sorry, my uh, L.A. friends. But in California, I think I probably first saw this in L.A. But the labeling is really interesting. Like you had mentioned that something was li actually labeled as a carcinogen. And the cancer space is you know, you have the cancer biologists and then you have the oncologists and there's so much, the, the, the field is so rapidly, um, I don't want to say advancing, but there's so much research being done. And mm -hmm. then it often takes a lot of time for information to get to the public. And there's this goal to create policy to actually impact change. And, and really policy often is not necessarily thought of as an individual level. It's really these generalized recommendations. Right. And this was one of these generalized recommendations was this Proposition 65. And it said, uh, if if anyone goes to California, they may see a warning, uh, a warning that coffee, have you seen this? You've seen it, right? I've seen it, okay. yeah. I'm just going to read this. Coffee is a beverage that contains a mixture of many chemicals. Some chemicals are present in unroasted coffee beans and some, like acrylamide, form during the roasting or brewing. Some of these include acrylamide cause cancer. Uh, others, including antioxidants and dietary fiber, may, may protect against cancer. Um, so yeah, it just goes on to talk about the potential warnings required and uh, about cancer. And it says because it has acrylamide in it. 
Yeah, I mean, I think some labels existed to more so protect the the coffee brewer company from a, a business perspective, mm -hmm. and not necessarily because it's like super realistic advice. Realistically, the levels, assuming that the coffee brewing company is doing justice and and putting out a mm -hmm. safe product, uh, there shouldn't be <laughs> significant amounts of acrylamide. Like I work with acrylamide regularly in terms of like making protein gels, SDS page gels for those of you nerds out there, <laughs> including yourself. No, no, definitely um, hard pass on that one. <laughs> yeah, no, we work with acrylamide regularly, but we have to be very careful, especially when it's, um, you know, in powder form. It's probably not in powder form when you're working with it. As a powdered form, it's, it's carcinogenic, but when it's, you know, as a... Uh, cross-linked to something else or chemically conjugated to something else or in very, very low amounts, the dose makes the poison. You've heard that time and time again. I, I, I wager that it's very, very low in regarding parts per million uh, where it's not going to harm somebody unless you're consuming gallons of coffee a day, which then you'd have other issues. Right. Yeah. yeah. Let and alone caffeine addiction. <laughs> <laughs> right. And no sleep. Yeah. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> when I think about things like that, it, it often translates over to, okay, so what are the other things, the other chemicals in foods or put on foods like pesticides and um, uh, fruits and vegetables? There was this whole big thing on the Dirty Dozen, which have you seen the Dirty Dozen? A little bit, yeah. Okay, so the Dirty Dozen is like the, the list of uh, produce or you know fruits and vegetables that potentially have higher amounts of pesticides. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure actually, quite frankly, how accurate that is. And if we can really translate does do these pesticides in the amounts that we're getting do they cause cancer what do we know about these kind of environmental components yeah so an example of one that i've talked about on my own instagram is, is glyphosate um and in general um it's an herbicide you know people use it um, to protect plants um but when those crops are processed to be sold to a consumer uh, the amount of glyphosate again in parts per million that's making it to the consumer is so low that you'd have to consume a literal shit ton of, of veggies to where it would actually harm you. The only people I'd be worried about in terms of handling pesticides and herbicides are the actual farm workers. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there, there's still safe um, safeguards we can put in place to protect farm workers now that we know more about these carcinogens, you know, the levels of, of interactions and how they relate to specific cancer types. Um, but regarding consumption of vegetables that you know, are, you know, potentially have a little bit of herbicide or pesticide on them, which is negligible at best. Um, I think people are, are afraid for kind of no reason. Mm. And a lot of that stems from people online with big mouths um, who assume they're correct about things, but they aren't. But and it makes people scared. It makes within people reason. scared. It makes people scared within reason. And, and I think that there's, um, I think it makes logical sense to think, okay, Absolutely. so if we are eating uh, fruits and vegetables that are sprayed, potentially that's not a good thing. Yeah. But again, um, how much of it that we're getting, and again, I don't know these answers, but I, I think that when we start talking about organic versus not organic, and then the next level is what if someone can't afford organic, mm -hmm. and we know that fruits and vegetables are important and dietary fiber is important, what is kind of the message that we end up sending people? It makes people very afraid in an environment to function. Yeah. And um, I think that that's a, a real negative. So how do you think we combat the fear associated with people consuming food? Because I'm not like a nutritionist, yeah. so I don't necessarily know. Um, and it's something that I see regularly following Lane Norton and things like that, yeah, and even Food Lane. Science Babe, which yeah. is awesome. Um, and uh, one of my friends who's a nutritionist, uh, her... Her Instagram handle is Cancer Nutrition HQ. It's yeah. uh, Dr. Crystal Zuniga. I don't know if you've spoken to her, yeah. but we try and you she know, agreed. Talk... She's going to come on. Yeah, We're great. Talk about she, she's going to be awesome. Cancer and sarcopenia, cachexia. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah, I've collaborated with her in the past. She's awesome. But um, you know, uh, going back to my question, how do we? How do you think we resolve these these issues? Yeah, I, I think it's really tricky. I, I don't know, but for. In our family, I would much prefer to have my children have fruits and vegetables than not. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, so that's kind of how I think about it. In terms of risks, what are some of the other? We talked about alcohol as a known carcinogen. Mm -hmm. Can you run us through a few of the other known risks? Um, yeah, and it's something I talk about on my channel quite often is, is lack of exercise, um, leading a sedentary life. Um, is a pretty well-known risk. Of course, you know, depending on who we are, 
you know, our accessibility to uh, a gym or various, you know, workout equipment, uh, we're, we're all going to have certain abilities regarding, you know, our level of exercise. So again, lack of exercise is, is a known contributor to not only cancer, but um, a variety of diseases like obesity and um, heart disease, which is actually, you know, more prevalent in society than, than cancer. Um, Although I really question that. It's crazy, but you know, on a, di a death certificate, even if you die of natural causes and your heart stops, where do you get categorized? Yeah. So actually my mom, you know, as an example of this is uh, my mom, you know, had very clearly had cancer, but she died of a heart attack. Who's to say it wasn't heart disease? Right. And, and so I they... think even on her death certificate, it was like heart complications. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, she had right. a lot of chemo and a lot of medications and she had cancer. <laughs> that was a fact. Yeah. And these things affect, you know, your overall metabolism mm -hmm. and eventually put a lot of stress on your heart. Mm -hmm. And no shit, she died from a heart attack. And that's uh, unfortunately perhaps how she was uh, categorized. Yeah, most likely. Because that's that's all the uh, the coroner sees mm -hmm. or the mortician. And, you know, or whoever, you know, had yeah. to kind of document that. Exactly. In terms of the mechanism of action, do we know the mechanism of action as it relates to cancer, exercise implication on cancer? So there are a variety of different mechanisms. I'm um, actually just released a reel talking about uh, a newer established mechanism, which um, kind of relates to the immune system. So your immune system is very uh, interwoven with your your lymphatic or sorry, your lymphatic system is very interwoven with your your skeletal mass. Um, your skeletal mass actually drives lymphatic fluid movement, um, which is something I've spoken about as well. Um, so there was this new study that showed that basically, you know, in, in mouse models, um, these mice who exercised had increased levels of this cytokine, which kind of produced this anti-cancer effect. The cytokine is a, it's a protein called IL-15 or interleukin-15 for those specifically interested. Um, and... You know, that's one reported mechanism of how, you know, exercise may increase interleukin-15 levels in your serum and reduce tumor growth. This would be like in cancer patients as an example. So it's it's very important for cancer patients to exercise. Um, but regarding disease prevention, um, you know, just reducing overall fat mass in the body, uh, particularly viscerally, um, would be a, a good way that we can reduce disease risks. Mm. Do you think that we can prevent cancer? Uh, contextually, it... within reason, right? So like some people have genetic predispositions for cancer, like we talked about Lynch syndrome to begin with. Um, those people may have to do more to reduce their risks for cancer. So I'm very remiss to use the word prevent. And actually, uh, there are some people when I first started my channel, I was using that word a lot and it was actually triggering a lot of triggering a lot of uh, of cancer patients it makes people upset because it right. implies that they could have done something they could have done something and oftentimes there's not much you can do you can do the best you can do but that's it you can't do any more than what the best is and so regarding prevention or risk reduction you know all we can do is eat a balanced diet try and incorporate fiber uh, if we have the ability to you know in our environment to acquire enough fiber various different types of fiber um, Eat lots of protein, exercise, try and keep our weight down, our blood pressure down, consistent checkups, um, which again is is a, is a privilege to have decent health care. Uh, it's another issue. Um, I'm not even going to get on the whole issue of insurance companies. Um, but, you know, there's a variety of things that we can do, but it doesn't always mean that you're going to prevent cancer. Some right. people just, you know, they're dealt a shit hand. Yeah. You know, you mentioned something uh, that I, I think is interesting. You said eat protein and <laughs> there seems to be a lot of, not so much, I don't think so much in the cancer space, but a lot in the nutrition space about protein and cancer mm -hmm. and protein, you know, they, they really go out on a limb there and say it's causative. And protein consumption being causative? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think a lot of this idea stems from, um, in a lot of specific cancer types, um, namely like renal cancers, pancreatic cancers, um, amino acid metabolism specific amino acid metabolisms are altered. And even, even in a paper that I published, glutaminase um, expression, glutamine uh, metabolism um, is, is affected in a variety of different cancers. And where do you get glutamine from protein? So it's easy to make that causative link between protein and cancer rates. But realistically, um, it's not 
it's not very accurate. Um, but when we consider, you know, when somebody has cancer, as an example, and you'll talk about this more when Crystal is on your channel, uh, cachexia is, is something that the majority of cancer patients end up suffering with because even as we treat these patients, it kind of creates this hyper catabolic state where anabolism, the, the building of, of molecules, um, is, is a much, much lesser than the, the breakdown of molecules. And you see cancer patients as they progress throughout their yeah. disease, they lose a lot of weight. And these drugs that we give them, they can kind of induce that as well. So it's kind of like we try and mitigate that response. And one of the ways that we can do that is by, at least now, and I, I'm starting to see this surge of, of medical health professionals in the oncology space increasing the amounts of exercise recommendations that cancer patients are getting, but also increasing protein um, consumption, various diverse, you know, sources of protein consumption, uh, to help offset those effects of cachexia. They're going to happen regardless. Yeah. Um, but again, um, you know, trying to incorporate more protein and, and exercise into a person's diet can help offset the effects of cachexia. I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I just want to, uh, highlight what you said that, that cancer is a multifactorial disease. Mm -hmm. By the time you get it, it is not caused by this one single food, right. right? It's not caused by a lean piece of meat or I don't know, take your pick, tofu. I love uh, tofu, I love steak. <laughs> and, and the mechanism of action, the impact on dietary, you know, dietary proteins, impact on mTOR, which is mechanistic target of mm -hmm. rapamycin, whether it's leucine, there's, alt, there's also other drivers of right. mTOR if people believe that um, dietary protein causes cancer it's I, I can't say that i've that that makes sense right and it and it doesn't even like when we go back to the hallmarks of cancer thing again which i'll probably constantly refer to um there's much more about cancer mechanisms that stimulate cancer progression than just the growth so even if a protein source contributes to you know uh, an amino acid source to progress a particular cancer type over time as that cancer progresses, it'll switch off mTOR signaling if it's not evolutionarily favorable. So there's this um, other aspect of cancer, like, you know, I'll go back to the evolution component. There's clonal evolution. So like I said in, in, in the beginning, uh, cancer, you know, when it starts, it's very different than cancer from, you know, a different time point towards the, you know, as the disease progresses. And the things when, you know, the mechanistic things when the disease began are going to be very different than the mechanistic things that, you know, kind of come about when the disease progresses. And that's kind of this idea of clonal evolution. Um, and it's also the premise of life on this planet. Life, you know, when you deal with specific stresses, you adapt to your environment, whether, you know, you have the genetic tool belt, so to speak, to deal with these things, but you have epigenetic or environmental signals within your mechanistic biology in your cells um, to help kind of offset and adapt to these, these cues. And cancer cells are no different than you. They are you. So they, they utilize these same mechanisms, the ER stress response being one of them that I studied, to adapt to these stresses over time. And so, yeah, they'll shut off mTOR when they don't need it anymore, and they'll evolve in a different way. That's even, even when we treat with chemotherapeutics. So like a common thing that we study is chemo resistance. Um, cancers are, you know, if we look at a solid tumor, uh, cancer, a solid mass, is not just one type of cell. There's immune cells in there. Even amongst the cancer cells, there's a subset of cancer cells that has a completely different genetic signature depending on where it is in the tumor than uh, tumors, tumor cells or cancer cells at the center of the tumor. Um, so when you give a chemotherapeutic to target a specific mechanism, um, you're going to kill off a subset of cells within that tumor that are sensitive to that, but then the other cells that don't respond to it all, they're gonna outgrow. And that's when you have chemo resistance. Those cells are resistant. You can't give that same chemotherapeutic anymore. And so that's often why we combine uh, chemotherapeutics as an approach to target those various populations of a specific cancer. And have we gotten better at treating cancer? Yeah, definitely. And I think a lot of that, um, that evidence is relied or reliant upon, um, you know, people with cancer now live a lot longer than they did before. Um, can, you, the, can you just... When you say a lot longer, do you mean it depends the on- five The five-year survival rate okay. specifically. So if we're Great. looking at five-year survival rate has gone up over time. Great. Um, you know, due to the, the very broad set of tools we have regarding chemotherapies, radiation, and now immunotherapies and surgeries. You know, there's the five pillars of cancer. Um, 
I think I forgot one. I can't remember which one it is, but uh, you know these these pillars of of cancer care basically they they've helped to increase the lifespan of of cancer patients very significantly over even the past ten years. Hmm. And in terms of early detection, we're starting to see again. We were talking about this earlier, Grail, which is DNA methylation. Yeah then that's something that we do in, in our practice. And uh, I think physicians are getting more keen on. Mm -hmm. Is the survival, you, you talked about the the way in which cancer progresses. Is your survivability increased if you catch it earlier? Or are some cancers like pancreatic cancer that even if you catch it earlier, your survivability is is still really poor? Your prognosis is really poor. So. Let me let me add some context here too, because like if you if, if you actually catch pancreatic cancer early, the survivability is is quite good. But the issue with pancreatic cancer is that we often have trouble detecting it early. So we are limited by the technology we have in the space um, to be able to detect specific cancers early. Um, if you can detect any cancer early, no matter what type of cancer it is, the the survival rate of that cancer is going to be significantly greater. The degree of which is going to vary depending on the cancer type you know, the various genetic component of, of a patient and, um, you know, other environmental factors that they have or have not had control over. Um, but yes, in general, early detection will reduce um, or enhance patient survival and in all aspects. Are you, so the GRAIL test, which again is that DNA methylation mm -hmm. test, that was originally just recently became available to providers. Is that something that you were familiar with or have been familiar with for some time? Yeah, so actually when this first came out, I follow a lot of people on social media. They sent, um, you know, kind of like these these amazing therapies that came out and Grail was one of the first ones that I covered just to, you know, kind of teach people about the technology and what it does. Um, it's something I would definitely suggest. I'm a huge uh, supporter of personalized therapy approaches. Um, and I think Grail, um, and other various blood-based tests are at the forefront of that in terms of determining uh, contributors to or even um, risk factors for specific types of cancers. Yeah, we had a, a, a military, you know, I, I work with a lot of the, the special operations and work with Hunter right. 7 and SEAL Future Foundation. And Hunter 7 is all about exposure risk. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my husband was in the military and he was teasing, asking you about Agent Orange. He's right. very concerned and uh, some of the burn pits and those kinds of things. We see an enormous increase, at, you know, and I say this um, hesitantly, but it just seems as if population based, the soldiers and the individuals that are exposed to these burn pits and just some of these other uh, organophosphates are really have a much higher level of cancer. Yeah, I, I don't know if you've looked at that, but one thing is that we actually caught a cancer early on. In, really? In, yes. Okay. So we had a positive Grail test. Okay. And it was, um, I think it was esophageal cancer. Okay. How did, so would you mind me asking how yeah. you revealed that sort of information? Um, Without well, getting into like the patient details, obviously. What, what do you mean? How do we? So we, what do, sort of markers did you determine were related to that person's likelihood of esophageal cancer? Great question. So we're starting to screen these guys early on. Mm -hmm. And um, again, this is not standard of care outside right. of, you know, for for example, for colonoscopy, typically you recommend a colonoscopy that is at 45. Um, and, you know, there's certain, you know, breast cancer and breast screening starts at 40. Right. Okay. Unless there's a family history. But we are starting to do grail tests on many of the soldiers. And this guy, it, it, the threshold to doing him is very low in what terms of it doesn't, if they're symptomatic or not, we'll still do it. Yeah. We'll still do it because, of their, measure. because of their exposure. Mm -hmm. So he was having some, you know, challenges swallowing and, and or, or just he, you know, had some sensation, but it wasn't detected mm -hmm. and he was evaluated and they didn't, they didn't uh, visually see anything. Right. So. So is, what is he doing now? If you don't mind that, I, that I don't know. Okay. I mean, that's, that's really know. interesting to me. And it's, it's cool that they, they were able to, you know, catch some semblance of yeah. esophageal cancer. I'm again, I'm a huge supporter of preventative care. I think it's something we don't do enough. And I think that, you know, companies like Grail are at the forefront of this. And I think that everybody should have access to this. I think it should be made just as, you know, a, a common measure of care as exercise. I think, you know, a, a gym membership should be part of everyone's insurance. Um, you know, like nobody should ever have to pay for a gym. I think, you know, these tests, 
just like we can give out vaccines, I think these tests should also be given out. Maybe that's a bold thing to say, but I think we don't do enough in this country, at least about preventative measures for disease. Yeah. Because again, when it comes down to it, if we can uh, catch any disease in an early stage, we reduce their, you know, or we enhance patient survival. Hmm. So, you know, um, I, I, I've actually never shared this, but my stepdad died of esophageal cancer. And to watch that was really, I mean, yeah, it's, um, you do, you feel very, very helpless. And the progression is, uh, you know, like slow and it goes away and there's all this false hope that, yeah. you know, now that you've been treated, it's now in remission. It's funny. It seems like you had that. Well, not funny, but it seems you had the same story. Like, you know, it, maybe it's a common trend. Like my mom also, she went into remission for, for a time there and then she just came back. And, uh, you know, I struggle with this and I'm curious to what your thoughts are at the time you know, when we were told that it was in remission, everyone is happy. And we're like, oh my gosh, this is so great. But they, I think there's a failure to understand that remission, I, I don't know if that is curative. It's almost like remission in that moment. But uh, do, do you know the likelihood of these cancers coming back? Yeah. So by definition, remission is just, you know, cancer at a relatively non-detectable level, or it does not appear to be growing. Um, it doesn't mean that you've cured cancer. Um, and so oftentimes there's, there's this misconception. I think, I think it's for good reason, um, because every oncologist I've spoken to hasn't, in my opinion, done a necessarily a, a good job at explaining those things and, and to no fault of their own, I, I guess as an oncologist, I wouldn't necessarily want to explain, Hey, you know, your mom's in remission, but, uh, this doesn't mean she's cured. Like nobody wants to hear that. Right. So like. I, I understand the sentiment behind why people don't know enough, but again, remission doesn't mean cure. And so there is this kind of false hope that goes into, you know, when somebody hears the word remission, they're like, oh my God, my mom's going to live longer. Or my stepdad's going to live longer. And then when the cancer comes back, you just, you just feel pissed, yeah. you feel upset, you feel hopeless. And you're like, what do I do? And it, there's it came, nothing you can't do. Totally. And it came back as back pain. He was just having this irretractable back pain. Yeah. And that was it. When, I'm sorry. Yeah. All things considered. Yep. This episode of the Dr. Gabrielle Lyon Show is sponsored by Inside Tracker. That's insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon. Again, understanding metabolic markers are critical to having knowledge about your overall health and wellness. This is another topic that I think is very critical to understand, especially in the light of discussing cancer. There are certain cancers that you can identify in blood panels. Everybody should have blood work done, you know, in a more optimal range at least twice a year, but certainly once a year. Head on over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon. Don't put things off like this. It's very important whether you do it through Inside Tracker or you do it through your physician. Blood work is critical. That is one of the reasons why I appreciate Inside Tracker sponsoring the show because it does make it available to you guys. InsideTracker.com slash Dr. Lyon for 20% off. There you will find many, many, many things to be able to add to your cart that will benefit your health, including what you will get is a action plan and information packet that explains your blood work and where the markers are. For a limited time only, get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. That's insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon. You know, when we think about when someone has a diagnosis of cancer, there's a lot of a lot of therapeutic options that are uh, outside the scope of chemotherapy and radiation. And those are, people talk about diet, a ketogenic diet. They talk about, again, exercise. Some people go plant-based. And you know, I've heard of people going down to Mexico and saying, well, I'm not going to do chemotherapy and radiation or I'm going to do um, juice cleanse or any, any of the other holistic ways, because I think as humans, we inherently believe that the body can heal itself. I'm sorry, I'm just going to scoot over here so I don't uh, sure. fall off into uh, Stefan's um, whatever setup. Uh, setup. Yeah. But there is, 
you know, the human spirit, I think, believes in hope and they believe that, you know, the body can heal itself. And I guarantee you, nearly every listener has been touched by cancer in some way, yeah. whether it's them, whether it's a family member, whether if they're a healthcare provider, they've seen someone pass away or a patient. Have you seen, how long have you been in the field? Uh, over 10 years now. Over 10 years. Have you, as of late and more recently, seen an explosion in natural treatments and the discussion around natural treatments and modalities of cancer? I suppose this has been around for a long time. Maybe I've just become more cognizant of it. Um, but I, I, again, I suppose this has been around for a long time. And I think that people have to be very careful where they get their information from. Because like you said, people will go to Mexico and get this kind of non-traditional therapy. Um you know, at least in the United States here, we do have FDA approval for things. And to get FDA approval for a medication requires very, very careful testing about the dosage, levels of toxicity. You know, there are phases to get things into the clinic, but other countries don't have that. So when you go to another country to get this, you know, untested therapy, this unvalidated therapy, you're taking a huge risk. And a lot of times it results in people just wasting their money, you know, on a therapy that doesn't work just because some social media influencer told them that it was a great idea. And there's uh, too many to count on one hand that that kind of have this approach. And and from a, a layman's perspective, it's, you know, it's understandable to feel that way. I empathize with people that, you know, want this, you know, natural approach to to healing their bodies, because there is like, as you know, I've, I've spoken about even here, ingrained mechanisms for how our body deals with various stresses. So our bodies can can deal with a lot of things. But you know, if you have cancer, it's not like you can just reverse that outcome by, you know, getting a stem cell transplant in a lot of cases. Um, and we're trying the best we can to kind of, from a clinical perspective, get the things that we test into the clinic um, so that it can be, you know, used in patients to increase their outcomes. But I think ultimately people also need to be patient with us. I know it's when you're, when you have a cancer diagnosis, it's, it's, you know, it's incredibly scary um, from both the patient's perspective and the family's perspective, but it doesn't mean that that holistic approach that we heard about online is going to uh, help the ones that we love. And so that's a lot of why my page exists so that I can kind of convey those complexities so that people can make better decisions about their health so that they say, Hey, you know, grandma, maybe you don't go to Mexico to get that alternative therapy because, you know, it turns out it's actually dangerous. And it can delay it treatment. It, it can also, delay treatment. It, it can, can counteract treatment if you're currently on treatment right. as well. Uh, I actually had a uh, mentor, she was a psychiatrist and she was diagnosed with breast cancer and she decided not to do radiation or chemotherapy and she um, completely changed her diet and went, you know, went to some of those alternative treatment clinics and she, she died. And maybe she would have, you know, who knows, had they been able to treat it early, there's no way to tell, but um, she died pretty quickly. Yeah. You know, when you think about the natural modalities, are there things that potentially could work? Do we know of any any potential modality aside from diet and exercise? Are there specific kinds of, I don't know, curcumin or turmeric or anything, tur what is that, turkey tail mushroom? Are there anything that we know can Im impact maybe perhaps prevention? and not treatment? I mean, there are a variety of supplements on the market, and I think a lot of supplement companies do mean well, but in general, the way that they display their information is um, is wrong most of the time. It's not exactly accurate. Um, regarding supplements as a risk reduction or preventative measure for cancer, I can say with some degree of certainty that supplements they're not going to help you that much. Um, so a, a common thing you might see is like NAD um, supplementation, mm -hmm. um, anti-aging and longevity. Realistically, um, if I were to take that supplement and I had cancer, it could actually make it worse. You know, some cancers, I've even published papers on this and some cancer types, um, at least high grade serous ovarian carcinoma, uh, they can use um, NAD metabolism to sustain their own growth. If I'm providing that mm. fuel source, you can make that that cancer worse. Um, so regarding reduction of risk, if somebody doesn't have cancer, I will say that in general, there's no supplement on the market that can reduce mm -hmm. risk. Um, now, if you're supplementing with something to try, like like whey isolate protein to try and increase your you know, amino acid intake for protein, 
or, or even like a greens. Like I know greens are kind of speculative to talk about, um, but if you're trying to increase your fiber, maybe consuming a green just from a, a micronutrient perspective, there's some vitamins and minerals in there mm -hmm. that can help you. Um, electrolyte supplements. I love electrolytes. Actually, in my, my bottle out there, I have one of the LMNT mm -hmm. supplements that actually Max got me involved with. Did, I love absolutely. Did you but, try the hot chocolate? Have you tried uh, No, I'll we're going to buy one. those. I'm going to mix it with my coffee. I'll, I'll, I'll give you some. I'm, yeah. I'm obsessed. They're so good. Yeah. But outside of this, um, supplements can help us get nutrients that we wouldn't otherwise get from our diet because, you know, in the modern world, we're taking a lot of those vitamins and minerals out of the foods we eat. Mm -hmm. So it's important to get those from other sources. Um, yeah, and those sorts of things can help us reduce disease risk. But things like turmeric, however you say it, um, not going to have that great of an effect. And you, you have to be careful. I'm sorry to interrupt no, you. Yeah, of course. Um, but, you know, sometimes the, the listeners are like, ah, she interrupts too much. Well, it's because I'm excited and I, I really... That's why I apologize because <laughs> I do the you know, same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're having a, a, you know, it's it's a conversation. So yeah. we, we're going to get excited. So guys, I'm sorry. I've uh, done a much better job as of late. Right, Stefan? Yeah, much better job as of late. I'm a, a very amped up human at, just in, in general. Yes. So, you know, there are isolated compounds that potentially have some impact. But again, these are just all mechanistic, right? Sure. When you isolate, say, whatever the your curcuminoid or, or whatever that molecule is in rodent models, that they can isolate potentially showing a mechanism. Mm -hmm. But again, what you're saying is it's just so incredibly complex. Yes. Um, but it. so again, I, I, I kind of suggest not to use supplements to prevent a disease, but we have used these chemical um, components to derive potential mechanisms for therapies. So a really good example of this, and, and I, something I've posted out about as well, is the the premise behind paclitaxel or even vincristine. These are standard mm -hmm. of care therapies right now, but their original foundation is they were purified, paclitaxel specifically was purified from a Pacific yew tree, um, from a, I think even the berry of the tree. And so oftentimes scientists look in nature first to derive compounds um, for, you know, for cancer treatments. Um, and so paclitaxel is a direct contribution from that or contribution from that. Um, so we just, you know, we get these, these plant extracts, we treat cancer cells, they die. What in that plant extract is creating this effect where these cancer cells are dying? Just from a very broad perspective, we can do chemical analyses on that extract you know, isolate the various components of them. Um, you know, considering the dose of a particular mm -hmm. component in the in the in the plant extract, and you know, isolate each one and test it on the cancer cells at various doses and dose curves, um, and determine which of the compounds has the anti-cancer effect. So, paclitaxel was produced on that. Vincristine was produced uh, upon that. Even cur um, curcuminoids, right. cannabinoids um, are another thing that are being investigated. Uh, THC derivatives uh, for those you know who aren't familiar with the cannabis, uh, you know, mechanistic or um, chemical names. Um, and it, actually, I'm going to post about that next week. Mm -hmm. um, it's a rebrand of an old post that I did. But you know, we take a lot of these these natural, um, these naturally existing chemicals and use them as templates. You know, to determine how they're interacting with specific cell types, when they're interacting with specific cell types, uh, their metabolic. Um, characteristics of how they're it's just mo molecule characterization and it's it's what you're saying is it's also much more structured yeah we can give it in a dose that we know how that yeah. dose interacts and then we can monitor it yeah and then we can change the structure chemically to make it more specific less specific in some cases because you know you can have too much of a response and we see this often with the case of even immunotherapies um you know you you hyperactivate the immune system against a, a cancer they'll secrete all of their you know, cytokines or chemicals against that that cancer, but you can have too much of a, of a good thing, so to speak, too much of an immune response against that cancer. And this is called like a cytokine storm. So we worry about off-target effects with small molecules targeting, you know, various metabolic components and leading to like hair loss and things like that with some drugs. But in immunotherapy context, we also look at like how our own responses to that tumor need to be kind of blunted to affect, um, you know, to keep a patient healthy. Mm. 
you know, we, we get a lot of listener questions and I, I want to kind of share some of those with you. Sure. And I'm just going to go through some of the lists because they're really, they're really interesting. So do, ready for this? Mm, okay. Of course. Yeah, here it comes. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> do carbs speed up cancer growth? They can. Tell me about that. Sure. Um, so there's this um, understanding amongst most people um, that carbs can speed up cancer growth. And a lot of that is reliant upon observations seen within PET scans. So for those you know who aren't familiar with a PET scan, a PET scan essentially utilizes uh, a radioactive isotope of glucose that's injected into the, the serum or the, the in a vein of a person. And all of your cells in general, utilize glucose to some capacity. But in a PET scan, you can weed out kind of that background of baseline um, absorption of that, that radioactive isotope of glucose um, to determine cells that have a higher uptake of glucose. And so this is um, an observation that was very early seen in, in the cancer biology field by people like Otto Warburg, so who is frequently quoted. The Warburg effect is real yeah. um, for yeah, the yeah. listeners. Um, but glucose uptake isn't the only thing. Glucose uptake is kind of like a, a a byproduct of cancer metabolism. They're they're increasing their uptake of glucose for a variety of reasons. Um, glucose can be a fuel source or a carbon source for a variety of different metabolic outputs. Um, and it's very complicated and it, it's very um, diverse between cancers. So this idea that glucose can fuel, specifically glucose can fuel cancer growth is true but it's, it's heavily context dependent, just like anything, just like protein consumption or amino acid consumption. The same could be said about amino acids. If I was taking BCAAs and I had cancer, you could say BCAAs cause cancer along the same lines, but I wouldn't say that because I know the context. Mm. Um, a lot of, um, yeah, like a lot of what people don't realize is when you, when somebody has a PET scan, all the cells glow in your body, but the ones that have the highest uptake of glucose are going to glow much brighter and you weed out that background noise. So, you know, like I said, all cells in the body use glucose. Uh, cancer cells have a preference sometimes, a lot of the time, not all the time, to utilize more glucose than surrounding cells. Would that be a reason why someone would have a lower carbohydrate diet or a lower glucose diet if they had active cancer? So this is something that's newer in terms of investigation. And we have evidence now that things like ketogenic diets may be helpful. I say that very, very um, carefully. I want to emphasize may be helpful. Right. This isn't, this isn't advice to say, oh, you should totally go on a ketogenic diet. But we have evidence to suggest that lower carbohydrate diets, such you know, like the mm -hmm. ketogenic diet, um, may help cancer patient outcomes. Actually, a group at Princeton um, published this study, uh, Josh Rabinowitz's yeah. group, which you actually had somebody on your, on your She's podcast. a She is a collaborator. Yeah. A Alexis Cowan. Yep. Yeah, Alexis Cowan. So she is actually in Josh Rabinowitz's lab. Yep. And they published a really, really beautiful paper about um, ketogenic diet being combined with standard of care therapy. And I believe the model was pancreatic cancer, which is great because you know we don't have really any treatments for pancreatic cancer, especially when it's detected late stage, which we spoke about. Um, but ketogenic diets alone in that paper didn't actually, it looked like it worsened the outcomes of the cancer um, in their pancreatic cancer model. But ketogenic diet in combination with the chemotherapy kind of, it looks like it shifts the metabolism of the cancer cells to be more susceptible to the thing that um, is targeted by the chemotherapy. So we're utilizing these sort of dietary strategies as kind of like windows of opportunity to treat a, a particular cancer type. And again, I think people need to be very careful about the diets, especially cancer patients, the diets that they choose to consume, because it could make things worse. I, I absolutely agree. Timing is very, very challenging um, when we regard therapeutic uh, strategies. Um, so I think that when we start a ketogenic diet is as important as doing it in the first place. Um, we don't have enough evidence right now to, to really say that with confidence. Um, people should be doing these things. But clinical trials are, are attempting to weed this, weed this out as Josh Rabinowitz's group is, is doing. When you say when they initiate a ketogenic diet, why, why do you say that? It, so let's say someone comes in with a new cancer diagnosis mm -hmm. and who knows, maybe they're eating a standard American diet. Arguably anything is better than that. When would, you know, would someone then initiate a ketogenic diet or perhaps they're interested in doing that? Would there be any downside? 
The only downside would be if they started it without knowing why. Fair enough. Um, if they wanted to do a ketogenic diet and their doctor approved it because of something they knew about their particular cancer type, again, um, their doctor would have to have strong reasoning as to you know why they would say you know this is a good idea or a bad idea. Um, but if somebody wanted to you know start a ketogenic diet or maybe high carb diet, low carb diet, whatever, high protein diet, there would have to be strong rationale to suggest it. But again, the level of evidence on this would be, um, we'd have to be very careful about making those, those statements, especially to a patient. Ready for another one? Absolutely. Fasting and chemotherapy. What, what does the research say so far? Fasting and chemotherapy. Not much. <laughs> And then again, yeah, how are you going to serve? So then you, now you're talking about uh, muscle wasting, eventually cachexia. And yeah. So that could actually be ideal. deleterious to mm -hmm. cancer patient outcomes because these people already, if it's late stage disease, again, if it's late stage disease, they could be having, you know, complications due to cachexia, which fasting would, God, that'd be horrible for that, for that particular patient. But again, in the context of, you know, things like the ketogenic diet, Fasting may be, you know, in some contexts, a window of opportunity to be able to provide a drug, assuming that the output of fasting creates a condition where treatment with something during that particular state will um, be more targetable to the cancer. Yeah. Uh, you know, with the fasting, you know, you do, I have seen you talk about autophagy. And this is, you know, this person asked, does prolonged fasting combined with sulforaphane actually work? So we, we've identified the fasting component of that. Sulforaphane, have you heard of that? The, it's yeah, like in broccoli. broccoli. Yeah. Yep. So Mark Hyman has spoken about this, and, and I've kind of spoken about that in the past somewhat abrasively. Um, but in general, the research is not in favor of this. Okay. Thoughts on IV vitamin C and ozone for adjunct therapies? No good evidence. No good evidence. Yeah. And I've I've tried, trust me. I've I've tried. So like I again I empathize with people. They ask me these questions. I look it up and that's one of those things I, I see next to no evidence for. Mm. And usually it's from these obscure clinics in the middle of nowhere. Let's talk about um, you know, you mentioned stress. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about and you know, you talked about uh ER stress. Mm -hmm. Do you look at other components of stress? So anxiety. Ang okay, let's talk about it. Um, so I, I did a post a while ago, and it's going to take me a bit to remember here. But um, so I did talk about if there's any sort of links between things like anxiety-related stress to cancer, and it's really hard to tease apart those those kind of psychological aspects in relation to cancer. But you could reason that there's um, behaviors which might make one more likely to be susceptible to uh, any disease, let alone cancer, due to like, you know, risky behaviors and things like that, which I was literally just talking about with your husband. Um, not that he's into risky behaviors. <laughs> not that he's ever been into any risky behaviors. He's never taken any risks. Um, but yeah, so in general, there's there's evidence for, you know, stress being related to it, but it's not causative. Not causative. Um, yeah. And that was a question someone had asked about, are there certain personality types that are more likely to get cancer, whether it's the type A? I haven't investigated this, <laughs> but I, 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 being a type A person, would probably say that I am much more likely <laughs> getting cancer than maybe some of my more chill collaborators. Yeah. Um, I, I really like this question. In a career like the fire service, what ways can we prevent getting cancer? So they're exposed to a lot of this kind of smoke and not just the smoke, but the things that they practice with. You and mean, uh, firefighters? Yeah. Yeah. First Form has graciously sponsored this episode. Today, I want to mention the greens and reds, especially because the topic is cancer. And one of the things that we know that helps protect against colon cancer is fruits and vegetables, and many of us are not getting enough of that. One of the reasons I love greens and reds is because this is an easy way to get many of the beneficial nutrients. First of all, they taste amazing. When I was younger, my mom used to make this stuff. It was almost like wheatgrass. That stuff was so disgusting. I don't even know how she drank it. Every time I took a sip, I legitimately wanted to just barf. However, OptiGreens 50 tastes way better. Nothing artificial, no colors, flavors, sweeteners. It's 100% non-GMO and gluten-free. 
and I highly recommend you try it. It is 100% organic grasses. It has superfoods, phytonutrients, digestive enzymes, and probiotics. This is one of the most complete green powders on the market. OptiGreens 50, blend of eight organic grasses and greens. It delivers nutrients of a two-ounce shot of juiced greens, and you have little packets that you can travel with. So head on over to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion and check out OptiGreens 50 as well as their reds. Any suggestion on ways in which they could prevent that? And I think where he's going with this is uh, detoxification pathways, I don't know, sauna, <laughs> glutathione, these things that people oftentimes thinks of, think of as it relates to detoxification. Yeah. Um, you know, some jobs, they just suck. Mm -hmm. There's not much you can do. I yeah. think your husband would agree having yeah. been in the military, especially in the special forces. Yeah. Special operations. Special ops. Sorry. My bad. Special forces are very different. <laughs> yes. That was an insult. My bad. <laughs> that was an insult. Not, uh, come on. Not, <laughs> come on. You, come on. SF guys, we love you too. Yeah. But, um, you know, some occupations, they just suck. Um, you know, firefighters, we can, we can try and invent mm -hmm. or engineer better ways that they can be protective are protected from, you know, dealing with fires. Um, but sometimes that's just the nature of the business, whether or not these, these guys can supplement, um, sorry, guys and girls, mm -hmm. uh, can supplement with, um, particular things to help offset their effects due to their occupational exposure to smoke, various carcinogens. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't quite know, but I know things like glutathione are probably not the answer considering, you know, just how much glutathione is in your body. I think in general, the whole glutathione supplementation is, is a bit of a, a scam because it exists in like, I think even millimolar range in your body. There were, unless you had some sort of disease, which glutathione was severely depleted, mm -hmm. there would almost be no reason why you take something like a glutathione supplement. Do you take any supplements? I have in the past. I don't anymore because I started learning. And um, so, I mean, I've, I've just kept it to the bare minimum. So like, I also found that I felt better when I stopped taking as many supplements. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've tried, you know, pro hormones and things in the past, um, which is not necessarily a supplement, but, um, you know, I, I take pre-workout right now. I have whey isolate, um, fish oil. I like, I've taken fish oil in the past. Um, but I actually, I, I try and focus on consuming the foods where I get the fish oil from. So if I weren't eating enough foods that had omega threes or omega sixes, those things, I would, I would maybe consume an omega-3 supplement. Um, I have in the past, they're not bad. I, I actually am an advocate for taking something like an omega-3. Yeah. Uh, there's plenty of research to support that. I agree. And also we have to really understand that we're framing the context as it relates to cancer. Mm -hmm. And there are, multi, there are many other uh, preventative areas. There's many other diseases. There's many yeah. other things. All so, of which I don't know a damn thing so, about. <laughs> so as the listener is thinking about this, I, I want you to understand that we are really talking about the evidence to the best of our ability as it relates to cancer. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's just important no, for, for people to understand. Okay, we got lots, tons of questions. Can charred meats be carcinogenic? Yeah. Yeah. So there's um, a few studies and, and a lot of people, you know, they, they want to say that red meat causes cancer. That's false. Um, but the way that we cook certain foods like meats can you know, produce carcinogenic things like, you know, firefighters going into smoke as an example. Um, heterocyclic amines, when you cook yes. proteins at high heats, particularly red meats, um, it'll break down the amino acids to produce these carcinogenic compounds like heterocyclic amines, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, I think that's the other one. Um, and the NCI, the National Cancer Institute has, you know, released information on this as well. Um, ultimately, you know, we, we should be consuming a decent amount of red meat, but within reason. Um, but the way that we cook it very much matters. Um, if we're eating it a lot and we're always cooking it over the grill, probably not the healthiest thing to do. Um, so yeah, so we should keep our red meat consumption within uh, reason, but also consider the way that we cook it. Mm. I love I love a charred, charred <laughs> steak. Medium rare is my shit. But um <laughs> You know, I, I try and limit the amount that I consume just because of the, you know, the, the heterocyclic amines, mm. the polyaromatic hydrocarbons that come from cooking at a high temps. And do we know the, the dosage? 
for example, do we know, okay, there's, if you have one charred steak a week or it's still just... We don't necessarily know the dose. I, I would say I would feel comfortable. I, I actually eat probably too much mm. red meat. Um, but I would say, you know, one, you know, delicious steak a week cooked mm. over the grill is a decent, reasonable explanation. Mm -hmm. um, maybe even two. But again, a lot of this is very individualistic from a dietary perspective. If that's the only thing I'm eating, it's going to give me some health issues. A lot of people think, oh, red meat causes, you know, cancer, but they're not considering red meat alone may produce specific outcomes to disease. But we also need to consume other things like vegetables, fruits, you know, all these other mm -hmm. things that come with our diets to help offset those effects that consume, you know, come from just consumption of one food group, right. which right. you would expect because you're just consuming one, one food, food group. group. Yeah. People ask about, there, is there a connection between prostate cancer and TRT? I don't know if you've looked at that. I haven't looked at that, but I would imagine that there would be a link due to the androgenic signaling, which happens and is directly related to prostate cancer progression. I'll, uh, I'll jump in on, on the prostate TRT one. Sure. So the, um, so TRT, typically testosterone replacement therapy, does not cause prostate cancer, but it would be more likely to reveal it if an individual does have it. So there's that. It makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for adding context. Yeah, there. no, no. Because I, I, I don't want the listener to be like, oh my gosh, I, I've been on TRT forever. Yeah. Am I increasing my risk? There are states in life where TRT is, is going to be favorable for a lot of people, especially totally. men as they age. Totally. Yeah. How can we avoid it? Biggest cause of cancer? Ask all these questions here. Now, this is an interesting question. Um, do high cortisol levels contribute to cancer? So we, we, we just kind of touched on yeah. this a little bit regarding stress. Um, not a causative way, but I'm, I'm sure given the evidence that we eventually will acquire, not that we currently have, but I'm sure that cortisol levels, depending on cancer type, can directly relate to um, poor outcomes regarding cancer. Hmm. You know, it's, it's not easy to say, you know, to a cancer patient or somebody who has potentially cancer, Calm down. It's going to be okay. Totally. Cortisol is, is it's also like a, it's, my wife is a circadian biologist. So she is, she is. We yeah. got to get her on. Yeah. She's brilliant. <laughs> um, I would expect nothing less. Well, I have high standards. <laughs> um, so does she. So maybe she chose me. I would, I would wager that. Um, but anyways, um, so cort cortisol is circadian. Um, so we need a certain amount of cortisol to function normally. Um, so it's, it's hard to establish a baseline of what would be correlated to a specific type of cancer. So I imagine that's one thing that circadian biologists at the interface between cancer biology would have trouble figuring out. And I'm confident it's ongoing. Yeah. And what were some of the other, that you had mentioned the other cancers that you were specifically interested in. So you were really interested in ovarian cancer. You studied ovarian cancer. Did you all, and you looked at liver cancer. Mm -hmm. There was a third one, yeah? Ovarian. So ovarian. Ovarian, uh, leukemia. Leukemia. And liver a little bit. Anything unique to either of those, any th three of those, as it relates to preventative measures for the listener? Not that we haven't really already discussed okay. regarding preventative measures. Yep. Um, there are unique genetic signatures and metabolic signatures, but that doesn't necessarily mean much to the, the standard mm -hmm. viewer. Um, that's more so along like how we you know, decide specific therapies, which, you know, I provide those, uh, those contexts on my channel. Like why would we produce a drug to target this pathway in leukemia versus ovarian cancer? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it's going to depend on the BRCA status for over, you know, regarding ovarian cancer or breast cancer. Uh, leukemia, a lot of it is metabolic, maybe carcinogen exposure, those sorts of things, How liver cancer, alcohol, whether or not yeah. they've been infected with, uh, um, HBV. Yeah. How effective are some of the treatments for breast cancer? Because I think that that is something that really does scare a Extremely lot of Extremely effective. effective. So yeah. I, w yeah, I'm, I have to be very careful when I talk about breast cancer because it is a very emotionally charged topic. Mm -hmm. I've actually been told that as a man, how could I understand it? Because I don't have breasts, which is somewhat comical because I'm a mammal. <laughs> um, all men have breasts if, you know, listeners need to be informed on that. But um, 
Regarding breast cancer, the treatments that we have for breast cancer are very, very good. Um, and not only regarding detection, we've gotten a lot better in terms of detecting breast cancer early, but even if you know we have some of these more metastatic cancers, um, triple negative breast cancer being one of them, the therapies for that are, are very good and they've very dramatically increased um, patient outcomes, uh, positive patient outcomes over the past even five years. Yeah. And if so. there, there, if there was, and and I, I think that we can all agree that um, that's super important in early detection, like you said, getting mm -hmm. regular mammograms. I know people are, they're concerned about the impact of the mammogram yeah. on the tissue, and I have uh, heard that you know some of my patients will say, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not going to actually get image because I'm afraid it's going to cause cancer. And I said, listen, these are the things we have to look at and, yeah. and I think that it's really critical. So if you've been, if you're lis a listener and you're putting it off, then uh, you should go get any of those, those screening tests. Yeah. Can I, can I add a little Please. bit? Of your, yeah. So regarding mammograms, I think it's incredibly important that people try not to be afraid to get them. There, there is no evidence to suggest that getting a mammogram will actually worsen breast cancer. People say, oh, touching around the breast tissue, touching the lumps engages metastasis characteristics in the cancer. It doesn't. There's no evidence to suggest that. Um, but there is a reasonable amount of fear that comes with finding a lump in breast tissue, whether you're man or female, or male or female. Um, so I, I strongly empathize with you know any any listener who who is afraid of getting a mammogram. I, I know it's scary if you find a lump, but you, you got to do it. Mammogram isn't the the end point. There, there are a variety of other tests. So you find a lump, you got to figure out what the next point is. You got to figure out what to do about it. Um, and a lot of times they're benign. So it's it's best after a mammogram. It's only one test, just like a PET scan. It's only one test. It's best to get multiple viewpoints, multiple tests done to kind of, you know, determine if it's cancer for one, um, how malignant it is or how bad it is, and then what you can do about it. Yeah, so I, I, I very much try to enable people um, to seek out that sort of information so that they can be less scared. It's scary. Fear associated with these things is natural, but... Um, action is critical. Action is critical. People have to act on these things. Yeah. Indecision kills people. For sure. Are there a handful of myths that you always hear? Other than sugar causing cancer, meat causing cancer. Um... A lot of the times these these myths come from people online who have a seemingly logical foundation, like we've talked about with, you know, with glucose or, or even insulin. Um, I know that Mark Hyman has spoken about insulin before, you know, being a causative link to cancer, but it's much more complex than that. Um, so I think that that is a, a myth, but there's there's logical reason behind why things like insulin and glucose fats can contribute to particular cancer types, but they're not the only thing. Um, and I think teaching people about these complexities and displaying um, kind of like the biological foundation, the cell biology aspect about them can can show them, you know, the context behind why certain things occur so that they don't make those strong, in, um, those strong statements about correlation and cause. I think that a lot of this, these myths arise from people's, you know, understandably, uh, they're their misunderstanding of what correlation and what cause mean. Mm. So, and if you had one wish that everyone could walk away with after hearing you and listening to you, I think that you feel very passionate about the subject because of your experience mm -hmm. and that initial experience of being very helpless. Yeah. Is there something that you wish for everybody? Because you are, you're really spending a lot of time trying to educate people. Yeah. And that, that's not an easy task. And there has to be a reason and a driver much bigger than it's not about you, right? There has to be another reason as to why you are doing what you're doing. Yeah, I don't, I don't do what I do for my own um, purposes. I, I don't want to make money off of what I do. People have asked me, write a book, sell it. I will, I will always everything that I do about cancer biology, I'll always give away because I feel like, like, like we've talked about or we've spoken about this. There's this, there's this huge issue with people's lack of understanding of science. And I get it. It's complicated. We've dedicated our careers to it. Um, so my hope is that no matter what I discuss, people walk away learning to think much more critically about just how diverse and also how beautiful life is. 
we exist as human beings on this planet for, you know, to, to exist as a part of our environment. Um, we aren't special. And I think that displaying the complexities associated with even our own biology can relate to how people understand, you know, other things in life. So I just want, I, I really just want people to think more critically. So that way, when they hear that person on online saying, you know, like insulin causes cancer, sugar causes cancer, fat causes seed oils, for Christ's sake, you know, again, all of these ideas, they're within reason. They have a logical foundation. So you don't think seed oils cause cancer? I don't care if they do cause cancer. But beyond this, there's, there's discussion to be had about how these things can contribute to any disease, let alone cancer. I'm sure seed oils... When you, when you dig down to it, sugars, they, they have these contributors to any disease, but the conversations need to be had with people so that they can understand when these particular contexts can relate to a disease. Instead of just making this blanket statement that, you know, is, is easy to misconstrue and, and misinform others on. And make people afraid. Yeah. I don't, I don't want people to be afraid. So like, that's, that's my goal is just, you know, I have a lot of goals, but <laughs> that's, I just don't want people to be afraid. Um, it's, you know, learning is a very hard process. It's scary. You know, you don't think, I think if anyone was more scared during their you know, education to realize that cancer is just horrible, it's a horrible disease. Yeah, and horrible. my mom didn't really have much control over it. To realize that, that's depressing, man. I was up till like two in the morning just combing every section of my biochemistry book, cancer biology books, because it was addictive. But also at the same time, it was like, just to feel that this wasn't necessarily her fault gave me some sort of therapeutic value. And I want to provide that to people. People well, need to understand that and not be scared. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, we'll link to all your channels and we'll do a part two. <laughs> <laughs> we'll link to that. Yeah. Uh, then you should definitely have a newsletter. Um, but I would love to have you back on. We'll get some more questions from the listener because what I, I think you do a great job at is that there's a foundational understanding that you're bringing forth and you're really putting an effort to bring that forth. Mm -hmm. And I think by you talking about some of these things, it's really going to save people's lives. I hope so. Because there is, this is the, the more afraid of something we are, the more vulnerable yeah. we are to influence around it. And by coming and having a conversation about what you know, what are the potential implications and perhaps we get screening at, you know, these intervals and maybe you actually go and do genetic testing for how we're going to initiate the chemotherapy versus going to uh, some other place to be treated for a cancer that you could have survived otherwise. Right. And that's critical. Yeah. So thank Again, you. Again, it's all about just enabling people to make better decisions about their health. Thank you so much. Joe. Thank you. I really appreciate it.